Hello, welcome to The Kingdom View. I am your host, Lou Ann Toposki. I'm so happy to be with you today and thank you for joining me on The Kingdom View. The Kingdom View will have three different types of programs. One, you'll have a teaching from me and I will teach on keys to living in the kingdom of God here on earth or two, you will receive an interview. I will interview someone and someone who is literally living in the kingdom of God here on earth, whether it's in their family system, in the neighborhood, in their business. It could be a lot of different things, but sometimes we learn from people who are living in the kingdom. They feel the presence of God. They are hearkening unto the voice of the Lord, and they are doing exactly what the Lord is telling them to do. No matter what's going on around them, they stay focused. And so I will be interviewing people from time to time so that you can also see that other people are living in the kingdom of God here on earth and we just learn from each other. We get ideas and we are a family so we are to support each other and I would like to support my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, but also show you that there are literally other people besides myself and perhaps yourself too who are living in the kingdom and we just get fed sometimes spiritually by learning from other people. The other program I will do for you is we will have a panel of at least three people and we will talk about topics of interest. So there are a lot of topics of interest out there right now and you know it's an opportunity for all of us to come together as Christians and, and, and discuss what's really going on in the world and how the kingdom view views it right so we want to look at things in the eyes of the Lord with the eyes of the Lord and last week I started to talk to you about the keys of the kingdom living in the keys of the kingdom uh, living here on earth with those keys and the first key to living in the kingdom of God is knowing Jesus as your Savior right and not only is he your savior, but as you let him be your Lord, meaning he is guiding you. He said that he's leaving earth so that the counselor, the comforter can come and be inside of you. That's the Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. And as we hearken unto the voice of the Lord, as he speaks to us, and as we do what he's asking us to do then we are literally living in the kingdom of God in that moment and we can continue to live in the kingdom of God as we constantly listen to his voice are we perfect no no one is no one but Jesus was perfect and so we just do our best we can repent we can ask for forgiveness but it's better to hearken unto the Lord so for instance if you know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and asking you to do something specific and you're like, I really don't want to do that, that's not hearkening unto the Lord. That's not living in the kingdom. But if you say, okay, I don't really want to do that. Lord, would you please give me the courage to do that? Would you give me wisdom? Because I want to be obedient to you. I, it's better to be um, in alignment with you than to tell you I'm sorry. So Lord, please give me what I need. You've given me a sound mind. You've given me love. You've given me a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind, not of fear, not of anxiety. So Lord, I ask that you help me through this, and I'm going to say yes to you. I'm gonna give you my best yes, and let's do this together. And as you do that, and as you do it the best way you know how, because you have a sound mind, you have love for the Lord, you have love for yourself, you have love for the situation. You just, it's just uncomfortable. But as you hearken unto the Lord, and as you do what he's asking you to do, you're making him Lord as your, of your life. This is powerful. This is living in the kingdom of God. It's really easy, and it gets easier as time goes on. And sometimes, you know, God gives you something to do that you really don't want to do, like, like Jonah. You know, Jonah, what did he do? He was like, no, Lord, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to tell those people to repent. And he went the opposite direction. And what happened then? He was on this boat, and he was underneath in the bow of the boat, and there was a huge storm, and the sailors are like, what? 
what's going on? And he's like, the storm's because I didn't obey the Lord. Throw me overboard. Well, they reluctantly threw him overboard, and the storm stopped. And then what happened? Jonah was swallowed by, you know, a whale. And he repents in, in the belly of the whale. And then the whale throws him up on shore close to Nineveh, right? He goes, he teaches, repent, and what happened? They repented, and God did not destroy the city. So what am I saying? When we hearken unto the Lord, then everything's smooth. Everything's going, you know, we're living in the kingdom of God. But if we say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to go the opposite direction. It very well could happen that we could have a storm around us. You might have felt that already until you repent and then the storm closes. But we still have a calling on our life. That calling still hasn't gone away. It might have been 20 years ago that the Lord called you to do something and you still haven't done it. I'm telling you right now that he's still calling you to do it and you can do it. You can do it because that's not going away. If you're this side of the earth, you're alive, you can still do it. So ask the Lord, how do you want me to do this now? Okay, it's 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, right? But whatever it is, Lord, I want to do it for you. I want to hearken unto your voice because I want you to be Lord of my life, not just my Savior. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to have eternal life with you, but I want to make you my Lord. And I ask you, even if I'm, I'm really sick right now and I'm really not feeling it, I know you can work in me and I ask that you help to heal me or you give me direction. Show me what you want me to do for this calling. And as we hearken unto him and then we say, okay, I hear you. I see that I could do that. I can do that. Give me the courage. Give me the wisdom. And as you actually do it, then you are living in the kingdom of God and you're allowing other people to see your transformation. That's powerful. So it's okay to be a model, a model of Christianity, a model of how Christ works in us. So you are here for a purpose. Allow the Holy Spirit to work within you. So the first key was what? Allowing Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. And it opens up all kinds of opportunities. And the second key we talked about was paying attention to the commands of the Lord. Whether it's the commands we see in the Bible, the Ten Commandments, or when the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Those are commands of the Lord. Remember, in Revelation... Jesus was telling the um, Apostle John at that time, John was on the island of Patmos, so he was, he was away. And Jesus came to him. He wrote the book of Revelation. And in the very first chapter, Jesus said that those of us who believe in him, we are now his priests in his kingdom. We are his priests you are his priest. If you believe in Jesus, it's no longer Old Testament where you give your offering and tithes to the priests. That was Old Testament. This is New Testament. This is a new administration. And Jesus is saying, listen, these are now my priests in my kingdom. So read it for yourself. Go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Read the whole chapter. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit will speak to you. And that's the other thing, is when you read Scripture, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. It may be something that you may not have um, thought of at the time that you read it ten other times, but the Holy Spirit is a living, loving God, and he will speak to you no matter what. So number one key is have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Number two is paying attention to the commands of the Lord. The third key is repentance of our sins. Why do I say that? You know, sometimes when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we repent of our sins, right? We repent. And we, we say, yes, I believe you died on the cross for me. You rose again, and now you're seated at the right hand of God. And now I get to have the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, live inside of me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I repented of my sins. And that's wonderful. You feel refreshed. You feel clean. You feel good. But we're not perfect. We're not perfect. Jesus might remind us of a sin that we did prior to us, you know, accept, accepting him as our Lord and Savior. 
after our repentance and accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and it could have been 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? After our repentance, after we receive Jesus, we still sin because we're human. We might not have done something that the Lord wanted us to do. Give a ride to somebody. I really don't feel like doing that. Oh, Lord, please forgive me now because you're bringing it to my remembrance. The Holy Spirit will do that. He will bring it to our remembrance. And that's what we need to do. Lord, show me what I need to repent of because I want everything to be right in my soul. And that's a question you can ask yourself. Is everything right with your soul? If it's not, Lord, please give me wisdom. Show me what I need to do. Show me what I need to do so that I can have things right with my soul. Repentance of a sin is us honestly repenting, saying with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord, please forgive me. And this is a spiritual principle. It's a spiritual act. And when we honestly ask the Holy Spirit, Father God, Jesus Christ, to forgive us of our sins, what happens? We feel cleansed. That's his mercy. That's his grace. So we do it. We say it in the natural, in the natural realm. And we feel it in our soul, in our spirit, in our understanding, in our body, because it's always the mind-body connection. Everything is connected. Everything is energy. And as we ask God to forgive us for a sin with all our heart, with all honesty, what happens is he forgives us. And so we would need to then extend that to others who perhaps sinned against us. Our brothers and sisters, or perhaps they're not even in the Lord, and they say, hey, I am sorry. I forgive you. I forgive you. Jesus forgave me. I forgive you. I appreciate that you're telling me you're sorry about that. You're seeing that that's not right, and I appreciate that you're making that right with me. That's repentance of our sins is powerful. It is a spiritual it is a spiritual act and we will feel it in the natural and what happens is it opens doors it opens spiritual doors it opens other doors for us to move forward and to be here in the kingdom of God with the Lord it is powerful so this is a spiritual act when we repent for our sins we are released from the guilt because we receive the grace and mercy from our Lord we feel it in our body, you feel it in your body. And what I wanna say about that is you might say, why, how do I feel it in my body? Have you ever had a headache or a stomach ache and you just know that, you know, I just really need to make this right because I'm probably getting this headache or the stomach ache or this ache or pain or whatever it is because I know in my spirit, I know in my soul, I need to make this right. I need to do the right thing. I need to pay this bill on time. I need to apologize to someone. You know, the Lord told me to give this person a ride and I didn't want to and I told them no. I'm gonna call them now and I'm gonna say, hey, I can give you a ride, would you like that ride? So you're making things right. Repentance, you wanna make things right in your soul. It is powerful. And as we make things right, then those headaches go away, those stomach aches go away, because it's not, you're not tugging, right? You're not tugging. You're not tugging with the Spirit, right? We're not tugging. Jacob wrestled with the Spirit until the Lord blessed him. We can wrestle with the Spirit until he blesses us, but we can also wrestle with the Lord if we're not wanting to do what he's asking us to do. We're not going to live in the, in, in the presence of God. Well, we're not going to live in the kingdom. We're not going to have that opportunity if we're not repenting. We know it's the right thing to do. We just don't want to do it. So I'm just going to support you, and please just do it so that you can be free, and it frees somebody else, and we're to live in unity with each other. These are our brothers and sisters. How can we say, we love God when we hate our brother or sister. Hate, that's a strong word. Well, sometimes when we're disobeying the Lord because we don't want to do it for, you know, do this favor for this person, we just aren't feeling it. That's not love. It's not love. 
So as you love the Lord, as you love yourself, as you love others, as Jesus said, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is as the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. So what does your, your neighbor need? What does your friend need? What does um, a family member need? What do they need? What can you help them with? What is the Lord putting on your heart? So it's not like you're feeling guilty that you have to do it. No, that's not it. It's about the Holy Spirit. There's a difference. There's a difference. You will know what that is, and you can even pray about it. So everything we do in the spiritual, we manifest it in the natural. Meaning, again, once we get it right, headache goes away, stomach ache goes away, we feel cleansed, we feel good, we feel uh, good in the spirit. We feel like our soul is cleansed. We see this chaos going on around us. It's not bothering us because the dis we're discerning that that's the enemy working with other people trying to maybe ruffle our feathers, but maybe their feathers are being ruffled because we're staying focused on the Holy Spirit and how he is working in us. And as you do that, you are becoming, you are becoming a model for others, which is a good thing. So you're transforming and you're helping to transform others. Repentance is an opportunity. It is amazing. We might have consequences to our sin we have to deal with. That's okay. Deal with them and move on. Deal with it and move on. We are refreshed. We're like, okay, I got to get this right. I'll get it right. I'll do that. I'll get it right. Get it right. Get it behind you. Take off that old coat of sin and put on the robe of light and righteousness. That's what the Lord wants you to do. He's not mad at you. He just wants to bless you, right? Hey, come on, let's do this. We're all prodigals. And when you come back, I'm here. I'm ready. I want to hold you. I want to give you a hug. I want to say good job. And you're going to say that to your kids when your kids walk away from you. When your walk, kids walk away from you and say, no, I don't want to do that. But they come back and you're, I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, dad. Come here. Let me give you a hug because we love them and we all make mistakes. Repentance is for us, right? It relieves, it relieves us from living in that old way of thinking. And so the fourth key is love. We love because he first loved us. We cannot say we hate our brother and love God, right? First John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Jesus came, died for us, and because he died for us, we now have an opportunity to have Christ in us, the hope of glory, and God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So anytime we're feeling anxiety, worry, fear, we've got to know that's not of God. We might be uncomfortable about doing what it is that the Lord would have us do, but as we stay focused on what he wants us to do, we work through that fear. We work through that worry. We work through and we are transitioned, transformed into who God wants us to be and, and do. We have a calling on our life. You have a calling on your life. What is God telling you to do? What is it that you need to do so that you can walk in the love of Christ? Because if he's telling you to do something and you're not doing it yet, that means you might love the Lord. You might do so much. You might tie the little here. You might tie the little there. You might give a ride there. You might say, hey, I love you or call someone. But you're not going to do this one thing he wants you to do. What is it that he's asking you to do? When you don't do it, you don't really love yourself. You don't trust the Lord. And so I want to support you in trusting what the Lord has given you to do. Because when you do what the Lord has told you to do, you are showing that you love yourself. And you can't love others until you start loving yourself. You can pretend, you can pretend to love yourself, but until you do what the Lord is telling you to do, until you do that, you're really not loving yourself. You might be pretending, you might be showing people, you might, other people might 
might see or think that you are, but you know in your soul that you're not because the Lord is telling you to do something. What is he telling you to do? Because as you do it, then you're saying, I love you, Lord. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it because you created me and I'm going to do it because I love me now. I want to do it. I want to help others. I want to do this. I want to do this. And I might be worried, I might be afraid of what other people might think because this is a completely different person than what they're used to seeing, but I want to do it because I want to bless you. I want to be a blessing to you. You know what? We are workers together with you, Father God. I want to be a worker with you. I want you to work through me. So thank you so much, Lord, for giving me the wisdom to show me what it is that I need to do. And as you do that, the Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you now. The Holy Spirit is with me now. I haven't been doing this long. I've just been doing it for just a short time, but the Lord called me to do it. And he said, it's time. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so that's what we do. When we're called to do something, we say, okay, send me. Here I am, right? And so be willing to do what the Lord wants you to do, even though you're uncomfortable, even though you've never done it before, even though you're not used to doing it, even though other people might say, that's strange. It doesn't matter. Do it anyway, right? Because you love God, you love yourself truly, and you love others. And when you're doing this, you're becoming a model for others. You're transforming yourself. And when you do that, others around you will transform. They can't not. Yes, you're going to see some feathers ruffled because people aren't used to you doing certain things in a certain way. They're used to you doing these other things another way. But remember, you've taken off that old coat of sin. You've taken off that old coat of disobedience and you've put on the robe of love and righteousness and love and light, okay? John 15, 12, Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Listen, Jesus is telling us that this is his commandment, that we need to listen to him. So, this is my commandment, remember, 10 commandments. Yes, we want to hearken into those. We want to pay attention to those. But Jesus is also saying, this is my commandment, to love one another. This is my commandment. This is my commandment. So this is a commandment. This is a commandment that Jesus wants us to love one another. And as we love one another, we feel his presence. And also loving ourselves is loving others because we're all part of the body of Christ. When one is hurting, we're all hurting. When someone celebrates, we're all celebrating. And it's very, very important to support each other and listen to what other people are saying. So, you know, scripture tells us to submit one to another because we have the Christ in us, right? So as we are listening and submitting to one another, we're listening to this, the Christ in us speak to us we're listening to someone else as the Christ is in them speak to us. We're to submit to one another. We're to be aware that Christ speaks through them, speaks through us. Let's submit one to another. As we're submitting one to another, as we're submitting to the Christ in us, then we are joining together in the body of Christ. We are joining together. We are supporting each other. And we are becoming stronger in the body of Christ. One thing that we need to take into consideration in being in the body of Christ is something similar to what King David did before he was actually king of Israel, right? So King Saul was, was the king, but he disobeyed the commandment of the Lord. And then he went and he offered sacrifices and apologized, but he did that so many times that God told Samuel, the prophet Samuel, to go and tell Saul that, you know what, you've lost your crown now. You could have had everything. It, this would have been in your entire genealogy. But because you sinned and you did this one thing, and even though you sacrificed, no, obedience is better than sacrifice. And so as Saul basically was losing his crown, Samuel was told by God to go anoint 
David. Actually, he wasn't told to anoint David. He told to go to Jesse and to anoint one of his sons as the next king. And as, as Samuel went to Jesse and he, he saw all his sons and none of them would the oil pour out on them, none of them were called by God. And he said, don't you have another son? Are these all your sons? And Jesse's like, yeah, I also have David, but he's, you know, he's the shepherd boy. He's out there. And he's like, he's the one. Samuel's like, he's the one. Bring him here. So they bring in David and David comes. They, Samuel anoints him as the next king, right? He goes back out and he's shepherds for a while. Then what happens? What happens next is eventually there's an, there's a, there's a battle and Saul's out at the battlefield and he's got David's brothers out there and David's dad, Jesse, says, David, take all this food out to your brothers to the battlefield. So David does that because he's obedient, right? So he takes everything out to the battlefield and then they see that there's the battle and Goliath is there and Goliath is saying, you send one of your men and, I'll, and you come fight me and nobody in Saul's army wanted to do it. But David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who's coming up against the, ba- the, the, the Lord? No, 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 I'll go out there, send me. Look at that. He was ready to go. Saul gave him his armor, and he's like, you know, this is too big for me. This is not what God has equipped me to be, to have. But what he did equip him with is a slingshot. And when he went out there and he slung his his sling one time, killed killed the giant Goliath, fell, cut his head off, and he won, and he, uh, he was honoring God. David was honoring God, David, and Saul didn't like it. Eventually, Saul came after David. David said, I will not harm or say anything against the, the Lord's anointed. And we need to watch our words. We need to watch our words so that we don't say anything negative about, against the Lord's anointed. And so I want to leave you with that note today. Be careful what you say. Love your your friends, love your family, love, love, love. And if you would like to ask me about anything, come to me at Luann um, at thekingdomview.com or see me at thekingdomview.com.